Chapter 8 Vedantism, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Sufism While there are many great schools, and still more minor schools, of Oriental religio-philosophical thought, still our purpose may be realized by a brief consideration of the four great schools of the thought of the Orient, which have had the greatest influence upon modern Western thought and speculation. These schools are, respectively, one Vedantism, that great philosophic school of India, the conceptions of which transcend even the most daring speculations of the Western philosophers, two Buddhism, that great school which has now almost passed away from India, its birthplace, but which has many millions of followers in China, Japan, and other countries, and whose influence has had a very marked effect upon Western thought. 3. Zoroastrianism, that once famous school of Persia, which has now almost entirely passed from the scene, but which has exerted a great influence upon schools of thought of other countries and later times. And 4. Sufism, that strange mystical inner teaching of the Mohammedan religion, upon which it was grafted by some ancient teachers in order to protect it from destruction by the new religion of Islam. Let us take a brief glance at each of these four important schools of thought. The Vedanta school of philosophy is generally held to represent the highest flight of the Oriental philosophical thought. It dates far back in the centuries of the past, the best authorities generally holding that it was founded about 700 BC, although even then probably founded upon older teachings. It embraces many minor schools under its general class, being in fact one of the most Catholic of the philosophies. As Max Muller says, the Vedanta philosophy leaves to every man a wide sphere of real usefulness and places him under a law as strict and as binding as anything can he in this transitory life. It leaves him a deity to worship as omnipotent and majestic as the deities of any other religion. It has room for almost every religion. Nay, it embraces them all. Other Oriental philosophies do exist and have some following, but Vedanta has the largest. The Vedanta philosophy is the extreme of absolute idealism. By absolute idealism is meant the philosophical conception that denies the existence of the phenomenal world apart from the universal mind. Absolute idealism denies the existence of material objects, holding that their appearances are merely ideas of the universal mind. In the Vedanta, the highest phase of Hindu philosophical thought, the teaching is that the absolute, Brahman, or the divine mind is an absolutely homogeneous, pure intelligence or thought, eternal, infinite, changeless, indivisible. This being the case, it becomes necessary for the Vedantin to account for the appearance of the phenomenal world, with its succession of change and its plurality of souls. But the Vedantin does not shrink from the responsibility, but faces it boldly. He accounts for the world of phenomena upon the theory of Maya, illusion arising from avidya, ignorance. But this ignorance and illusion is held to be universal and not confined to individuals. The individual is bound by it until the scales fall from his eyes, and he sees the truth of the oneness. An ancient Vedanta teacher, living many centuries ago, said, The entire complex of phenomenal existence is considered as true so long as the Brahman and the self has not arisen just as the phantoms of a dream are considered to be dreams until the sleeper wakes. Thus the existence of the phenomenal world, while apparently real, is but the fiction of an illusory dream. It seemingly exists, while the state of ignorance persists, for, as Tennyson says, dreams are true, while they last. Moss Muller has said, Vedanta holds a most unique position among the philosophies of the world. After lifting the self, or the true nature of the ego, Vedanta unites it with the essence of divinity, which is absolutely pure, perfect, immortal, unchangeable, and one. No philosopher, not even Plato, Spinoza, Kant, Hegel, or Schopenhauer has reached that height of philosophical thought. None of our philosophers, not accepting Heraclitus, Plato, Cote, or Hegel, has ventured to erect such a spire, never frightened by storms of lightnings. Stone follows upon stone, in regular succession after once the first step has been made. After once it has been seen that in the banning there can have been but one, as there will be but one in the end, whether we call it Atman or Brahman. Arising from this extreme theory of absolute idealism, we may see the various modern doctrines of idealism, from Berkeley to the modern schools of new thought. The basic principle is that all is mind, 
and that all the phenomenal universe must exist as ideas, dreams, or pictures in that mind. Edward Carpenter says, We see that there is in man a creative thought source continually in operation, which is shaping and giving form not only to his body, but largely to the world in which he lives. In fact, the houses, the gardens, the streets among which we live, the clothes we wear, the books we read, have been produced from this source. And there is not one of these things, the building in which we are at this moment, the conveyance in which we may ride home, which has not in its first birth been a mere phantom thought in some man's mind, and owes its existence to that fact. Some of us who live in the midst of what we call civilization simply live embedded among the thoughts of other people. We see, hear, and touch those thoughts, and they are, for us, the world. But no sooner do we arrive at this point and see the position clearly than another question inevitably rises upon an S. If, namely, this world of civilized life, with its great buildings and bridges and wonderful works of art, is the embodiment and materialization of the thoughts of man, how about that other world of the mountains and the trees and the mighty ocean and the sunset sky, the world of nature? Is that also the embodiment and materialization of the thought of other being? or of one other being. And when we touch the things, are we also coining into touch with the thoughts of these beings? The Vedanta is then seen to be based upon the fundamental thought that there exists but one reality, and that, consequently, all else that seems to exist is but maya or illusion. This one reality is called Brahman, or that, the latter term being applied by some of its philosophers who bold that no name should be applied to the nameless one. Brahman is held to be beyond qualities or attributes, beyond subject or object, the efficient cause of the universe in its mental and material appearance, creator and created, doer and deed, cause and effect, self-existent, absolute, infinite, eternal, indivisible and immutable, all that is, ever has been, or ever will be. Max Muller states the Vedanta philosophy in a nutshell when he says, in one half verse, I shall tell you what has been taught m thousands of volumes. Brahman is true, the world is false, the soul is Brahman and nothing else. The Vedantist holds that there being but one, and that one being Brahman, there can he nothing else than Brahman. Hence, the phenomenal universe, including the idea of individual souls, is mere maya or illusion. The universe being but an idea in the mind of Brahman, a mere reverie, meditation, or daydream of the Absolute One. This, then, is the essence of the Vedanta, the remainder of the teachings being but an attempt to work out the how of the manifestation of the illusory universe which arises from Maya, the inexplicable illusion, self-imagined, that is illusorily overspread upon Brahman. It is taught that the total period of the creation, existence, and death of the universe is but as the twinkle of an eye to Brahm. The position of Christian science is that the divine mind images and idealizes only the things and qualities which, like itself, are pure and perfect, and that therefore all that is not pure and perfect cannot be the idea of the divine mind, but must, on the contrary, be the product of mortal mind and therefore must be unreal, untrue, illusion, error, lies. This position is also taken by many of the independent metaphysical cults of the day, who have come under the influence of the Christian science teachings, and who have appropriated some of its fundamental ideas. But differ as may the modern schools, their fundamental premise is that all is mind, and when they so assert they place themselves in the direct line of inheritance with the teachings of the Vedanta and the still older schools of Hindu thought from which the Vedanta itself sprang. Idealistic monism is older than recorded Hindu history, and undoubtedly had its origin among the earliest races on earth, the names and histories of which have passed from human memory. These newest thoughts of the so-called new thought of the day are in reality the very oldest thoughts of the race. Verily, there is nothing new under the sun. Buddhism, that once popular philosophy of India, has now forsaken the land of its birth and is almost unknown to the India of today, being represented by only a few northern tribes. In Burma, Ceylon, Nepal, Tibet, China, Japan, and other countries, however, the Buddhists hold their own and their followers are estimated at some 300 million souls. It is very difficult to explain the fundamental principles of Buddhism to the Western student, for his mind is not accustomed to considering a law without a lawmaker, 
which idea underlies the Buddhistic thought. Buddhism has been called atheistic by many Western writers, and atheistic it may be, for it certainly does not hold to the idea of a god in the Western understanding of that term. It holds rather to the idea of a principle of law which manifests in the countless and ever-changing shapes and forms and forces of the universe. At the last, however, Buddhism may he seem to hold to the existence of a something, infinite, eternal, changeless, and indivisible, under, in, behind, and holding together the world of change. This something may be thought of either as abstract law or else as universal will. But this will is to be thought of merely as an abstract thing rather than as a thing of properties, qualities, and attributes, but possessing infinite possibilities of manifestation. So, at the last, the Buddhist forms a conception of an ultimate reality which instead of being an absolute something, is rather the infinite possibility of everything. Rather a difficult conception for the average Western mind, but perfectly clear to the Oriental metaphysician. The Buddhist is accused of denying the existence of the soul, and so he does, in a way. He denies the existence of the individual soul as an independent and separate entity, but holds that it exists as a temporary center of consciousness in the all. To the Buddhist, all pain arises from this illusion of separation and separateness, and his aim is to overcome the illusion and to escape reincarnation, and once more to be absorbed into the one, all, as the dewdrop slips into the shining sea. This parinirvana the liberation, the attainment the Buddhist does not indulge in much speculation regarding the nature of the ultimate reality regards it as unknowable, and thinks that all speculation regarding it is futile and a waste of time. Either, he concerns himself with the path of attainment and liberation, the escape from separateness and illusion. His spirit is well expressed by Edwin Arnold, in his Light of Asia, as follows, O M. Amitaya. Measure not with words the immeasurable, nor sink the string of thought into the fathomless. Who asks doth err, who answers, errs. Say not, shall any gazer see with mortal eyes, or any searcher know by mortal mind. Veil after veil will lift, but there must be veil upon veil behind. The dew is on the lotus, rise, great sun, and lift my leaf, and mix me with the wave. As the sunrise comes, the dewdrop slips into the shining sea. Nirvana, the aim of every Buddhist in his earth life, has been described by a Buddhistic writer as follows. Nirvana is a condition of heart and mind in which every earthly craving is extinct. It is the cessation of every passion and desire, of every feeling of ill will, fear, and sorrow. It is a mental state of perfect rest and peace and joy, in the steadfast assurance of deliverance attained, from all the imperfections of finite being. It is a condition impossible to be defined in words, or to be conceived by anyone still attached to the things of the world. Only he knows what nirvana is who has realized it in his own heart. It is deliverance, and is attainable in this life. What many Western writers describe as nirvana is really the final stage called by the Buddhists para-nirvana, in which the individual soul blends into the one reality. When the dew drop slips into the shining sea and becomes one with the infinite. While the philosophy of Buddhism may be considered a negative one, the aim being a retreat rather than advance, or apparently so, still it has a high moral value and advances moral ideals of the very highest. As Max Muller has said, the Buddha addressed himself to all castes and outcasts. He promised salvation to all, and he commanded his disciples to preach his doctrine in all places and to all men. A sense of duty, extending from the narrow limits of the house, the village, and the country, to the ardent circle of mankind. A feeling of sympathy and brotherhood to all men, the idea and fact of humanity, were first pronounced by Buddha. But, although it has changed its dwelling place, Buddhism has left its influence upon Hindu thought, and its power is now manifesting itself in influencing the modern thought of the Western world. This has come about from various causes chief among which is probably the influence of and general interest in modern theosophy, the school established by Madame Blavatsky. To this influence must be added the popularity of the semi-Buddhistic conceptions of Schopenhauer and von Hartmann, in their idea of the world will, and the general leaning towards some of the original Buddhistic philosophical teachings on the part of certain modern scientists. Buddha's teaching that the ultimate reality is to be found only in a conception of a universal law 
rather than in a being, bears a striking analogy to the ideas of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus and to the fundamental ideas of our modern philosopher Herbert Spencer. Buddha's idea of the creative will, which is ever striving to manifest itself in ever-changing phenomenal shape, form, and variety, finds many modern followers in the philosophical school of voluntarism, the fundamental tenet of which is that the ultimate nature of reality to be conceived as some form of will, a view specially favored by Schopenhauer and his followers. The influence of Buddhism on modern Western thought is exerted through two channels, apparently unconnected, but still originally emerging from the same common source. Along one of these channels flows the stream of the Buddhist doctrine of reincarnation, rebirth, and karma, cause and effect operating in rebirth on the new life. Along the other flows the stream of the doctrine of the power of thought and will. The first channel and its stream reaches the Western world through the fields claimed by theosophy. The second wins its way through the somewhat diversified fields of the new thought movement. While the doctrine of reincarnation and karma is firmly held by the orthodox Hindu schools of thought, it is nevertheless true that it finds its greatest growth and richest flowering in the Buddhistic garden. The Buddhists have reduced the doctrine of reincarnation and karma to a science, and the ordinary Hindu presentation seems tame and subdued by comparison. The conceptions entertained by theosophy, so far as this particular doctrine is concerned, were obtained directly from Buddhist sources. Madame Blavatsky's writings on reincarnation and karma bear the impress of Buddhism, and still more plainly does the mark show on Mr. Sinnott's statement of the doctrine in his Esoteric Buddhism. While Colonel Alcott, one of the founders of the Theosophical Society, lived and died an ardent Buddhist. Theosophy itself, while it has outgrown some of the limitations of Buddhism and has moved into the general field of Hindu and ancient Greek thought, must acknowledge its indebtedness to Buddhism for its theosophies, cardinal doctrines of reincarnation and karma. And the general interest in these subjects manifested of late years in Western thought may be readily traced to the school of Gautama, the Buddha. Reincarnation, as every reader probably knows, is the doctrine of repeated rebirth in the physical body. The soul being held to have risen by degrees from the lowest animal forms, thence incarnating in a succession of human bodies, during many lives and personalities, from whence it shall eventually move forward to higher forms of life, until finally it shall enter into the blissful state of nirvana, bliss and freedom from rebirth. The term nirvana is distinctly Buddhistic the Hindu equivalent being tada, moksha, meaning liberation, emancipation, divine absorption, etc. Karma is the doctrine accompanying that of reincarnation, and the term means the law of spiritual cause and effect, the workings of which determine the successive incarnations of the individual soul. Each act is held to generate calm, or the seed of future action, which will sprout, grow, blossom, and bear fruit in future lives. Karma is akin to fate, but a fate arising from one's own actions, thoughts, and deeds, rather than imposed by providence. It is interesting to notice how the idea of reincarnation and karma has grown in the minds of Western people during the past two decades, originally repugnant to the Western mind. It has nevertheless managed to work its way to an acceptance on the part of many people who are searching for the new in philosophy and religion. It is now quite common to hear people discussing the probability of their having lived before the present life, and accounting for many of the happenings, joyful or sorrowful, of the present life, upon the basis of karma. The other channel of Buddhistic thought, through which is flowing a stream which is irrigating the Western lands, is that which is, bringing about the remarkable interest in thought force, willpower, etc., now noticeable on all sides. While the orthodox Hindu schools recognize the power of thought, force, and will, they are too much taken up with the dreamy, transcendental, metaphysical speculations to bestow more than a passing notice to the subject. Not eighty with the Buddhist. The Buddhist priesthood, in Tibet, Ceylon, and in Japan, particularly, have devoted much time and study to the subject of the thought, force, and will. They have evolved a distinctively Buddhistic psychology, of which the general Western world knows little. Chief among their beliefs is that thought force and will are dynamic forces capable of being employed for good or evil and which are operative over a distance. The phenomena of hypnotism, telepathy, mental control, mental influence, mental fascination, etc., are quite familiar to the Buddhists and are taught in their inner schools. 
the will is held to be the governing power, to which all else is subordinate. This so-called practical side of the Oriental philosophy, which proves so attractive to the Western mind, is distinctively Buddhistic in its origin and source, although belonging to the occult side of Buddhism and not to the philosophic, religious, ethical, or moral sides. The great school of Oriental religio-philosophical thought known as Zoroastrianism was founded by Zoroaster, or Zarathustra, the great teacher of ancient Iran or Persia, who is believed to have lived about 700 BC, that period of Oriental history in which was manifested the great revival of religio-philosophic thought, and which marked the founding of several great schools of Oriental philosophy and religion. Zoroaster's philosophy sprang into immediate popularity and at one time exerted a dominating influence over the mind and lives of millions of people. At present, it has almost entirely disappeared, its death blow having been dealt by the rise of the school of Muhammad, and today it is represented chiefly by scattered groups of parses or fire worshippers. But although it has almost entirely disappeared from the active scene, its influence in the past has been great, and its teachings continue today in other religions and philosophies. Zoroastrianism, once one of the world's greatest religions and philosophies, was undermined by the blows dealt by Alexander the Great and afterward almost destroyed by the Muslim conquerors. Today it exists merely as a memory, with but a few hundred thousand followers of its modern phases. But its influence has been great, inasmuch as it has supplied vital material for other faiths and beliefs, the majority of which are ignorant of their debt to the old Persian teacher. A wreck on the shores of time. Its material has been used to build many modern ships of faith, now sailing the sea of religious thought with swelling sails and flattering pennants. Or, changing the figure. I may say that although its flame is now flickering but feebly, and threatens soon to die out entirely, yet from it many other torches have been lit. Many fires kindled, so that it lives and will live in the lime to come, under many strange names and in many new forms. Professor Jackson has said, as a rule, the ideality and lofty spirituality of Zoroaster's teachings have been generally recognized, and the efficiency of the faith as a working religion may be seen in the fruits which it has borne in various ways through history and in its present followers, the Parses and Gebers. Haug has said, we must class Zoroaster among the real benefactors of the human race. Mills says, Zoroastrianism was the faith of many millions of human beings throughout successive generations. If the mental illumination and spiritual elevation of many millions of mankind through long periods of time are of any importance, it would require strong proof to deny that Zoroastrianism has had an influence of very positive power in determining the gravest results. West says, Zoroaster was the founder of a pure and sublime religion based upon the eternal principle of right and wrong, good and evil, light and darkness, and he was far in advance of any teacher of which human annals have preserved a record. Lang says, It is evident that this simple and sublime religion is one to which, by whatever name we may call it, modern science is fast approximating. Men of science like Huxley, philosophers like Herbert Spencer, poets like Tennyson, might subscribe to it. The Encyclopedia Britannica says, Zoroaster's teachings show him to have been a man of highly speculative turn, faithful, however, with all his originality, to the Iranian national character. With zeal for the faith and boldness and energy, he combined diplomatic skill in his dealings with his exalted protectors. His thinking is consecutive, self-restrained, practical, devoid, on the whole, of what may be called fantastic and excessive. His form of expression is tangible and concrete. His system is constructed on a dearly conceived plan. Zoroastrianism may be said to base its teachings upon the following fundamental principles. 1. That there exists one eternal principle, called Zarwana Akarana, which name freely translated means eternal. This principle is regarded as purely abstract, unknowable, unthinkable, and unspeakable. 2. From this eternal principle is held to have proceeded, simultaneously, the twin principles of good and evil, known respectively as Ahura Mazda, or Ormazd, the principle of good, and Anramanu, or Araman, the principle of evil. Ormazd created light, health, truth, and all good things. Araman created darkness, disease, lies, and all bad things. In short, 
These two principles represent the conception of God and devil, so common in later religious systems. When Ormazd and Armin first met, and time thus began, there arose a mighty struggle between the respective principles of good and evil, which still continues. During the first 3,000 years the fight was on the spiritual plane. Ahriman, arising from his abyss of darkness, was dazzled by the light of Ormst and was driven back. But gathering around him his hellish din, he renewed the attack. The second 3,000 years was marked by the creation of the universe and man, by Ormist, in order that he might defeat Ahriman. But during the third 3,000 years, Ahriman, the serpent-like being, invaded the world and tempting man mingled evil with good, and introduced sin in the world in order to corrupt the race of man and thus bring to naught the work of Ormist. Zoroaster taught that we are now in this second period of the conflict, with Armin in the ascendant. The conflict is now raging fiercely, Ormst being assisted by his hosts of angelic creatures, and Armin being followed by a horde of devilish creatures the legions of heaven and hell meeting and being engaged in constant conflict for the possession of the universe and the souls of men. The world is now suffering, pain, evil, sin and disease from the misrule of Ahriman, yet ever struggling toward good and Ormst. The teaching is that a fourth period of three thousand years is approaching, when man, seeing the value of good, will come to the aid of Ormist, and turning the tide of battle will defeat Ahriman and his devils, and binding them, will hurl them down to the bottomless abyss of darkness. Thereupon, in this millennium, good, light, truth, and health will be the possession of the race, all of which has a very familiar sound to the ears of the Western reader, has it not? By many of the students of the higher criticism, the book of Job, which is distinctively non-Hebraic, is believed to have been derived from Zoroastrian or pre-Zoroastrian sources. And, Students of comparative religion have long been familiar with the striking resemblance between certain portions of the Book of Revelations and the Zoroastrian teachings, the latter anti-dating the former by seven centuries. Moreover, it is claimed by careful students of the subject that many of the ceremonials, holy days, etc., of Mithraism, a branch of Zoroastrianism, were incorporated into the early Christian church during the first two or three centuries of its existence. Other religions have been materially influenced by this almost forgotten religio philosophy of the past. Zoroaster's moral teachings were excellent. His triad summed up the law as follows 1. Hamada, or good thoughts, 2. Yuxta, or good words, and 3. Varsta, or good deeds. He taught universal brotherhood and universal kindness to all, irrespective of race, country, or creed. Kindness to animals was enjoyed. Personal cleanliness was made a religion's duty. Work, likewise, was held to be a religious duty and virtue, the tilling of the soil being regarded as a sacred work. Zoroaster's golden rule was, think of, speak to, and act toward your brothers, and all men are your brothers, as you would desire that they should think of, speak to, and act toward you. Now on to Sufism. Sufism is the mystic and inner teaching found within the body of the Mohammedan religion principally in Persia and Arabia. It undoubtedly existed long before the time of Muhammad and is believed to have been incorporated in the religion of the Prophet in order that it might not be destroyed by his conquering faith. The legends are that Ali, the favorite disciple of Muhammad, was a Sufi and managed to save his mystic faith by persuading the Prophet to admit it into the new religion as an inner teaching. The Sufis have a legend which relates that the seed of Sufism was sown in the time of Adam germinated in the time of Noah, budded in the time of Abraham, began to develop in the time of Jesus, and produced pure wine in the time of Muhammad. The term Sufi is derived from the Persian word Suf, meaning wool, its use arising from the fact that the ancient Sufi teachers wore a single garment of undyed and unbleached wool. Sufism has exerted its principal influence upon the thought of the outside world by reason of its poetry. Nearly all of the great Persian and Arabian poets have been Sufis and have woven in their mystic religion by veiled metaphors the terms wine, the vine, the grape, and also the rose, the nightingale, the beloved one, and similar terms familiar in Oriental poetry having a mystic significance. Briefly, it may be said that in the Sufi poetry, such terms as the grape, the wine, the vine, etc., 
have reference to the mystic teaching of the Sufis, while terms such as the Beloved, the Damsel, the Rose, refer to the Sufi conception of the Divine One, the Lover, and the Nightingale, being the Sufi worshipper. As for instance this verse from Omar Khayyam, who was a Sufi, and David's lips are locked, but in divine high-piping Pahlavi with wine, 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 red wine, the nightingale cries to the rose that shallow cheek of hers to incarnadine. Or this verse from Jalaluddin Rumi, the soul love moved are circling on, lie streams to their great ocean king. You are the sun of all men's thoughts. Your kisses are the flowers of spring. The dawn is pale from yearning love. The moon in tears is sorrowing. You are the rose and deep for me. In sighs, the nightingale still sing. Sufism may be described as an absolute idealistic monism, tinged with a devout and fervent mysticism. An authority says, Sufism is the mystical and pantheistic doctrine of the Sufis. They consider that God alone exists, that He is in all nature, and that all nature is in Him, the visible universe being an emanation from His essence. The fundamental principle of the Sufis may be simply stated in these words. God is all there is. Besides him there is not. The universe is but a reflection or idea in the mind of God, and has no existence outside of him. To the Sufi the universe is a great stage upon which is enacted the eternal drama of life, in which the Divine One creates, moves, and then destroys the characters and the scenery, all being but mental creations and existing but in his mind. Old Omar Khayyam, that much misunderstood Sufi poet, states this in bold simplicity in his Rubaiyat, when he sings, whose secret presence, through creation's veins running quicksilver-like, eludes your pains, taking all shapes from ma to mahi, and they change and perish all, but he remains, a moment guest, then back behind the fold immersed of darkness round the drama rolled which, for the pastime of eternity, he doth himself contrive, enact, behold. We are no other than a moving row of magic shadow shapes that come and go bound with the sun-illumined lantern held in midnight by the master of the show, but helpless pieces of the game he plays upon his checkerboard of nights and days. Hither and thither moves, and checks and slays, aid one by one back in the closet lays. The ball no question makes of eyes and nose, but here and there, as strikes the player, goes. And he that tossed yon down into the field, he knows about it all. He knows, he knows. But this pessimistic and apparently hopeless outlook upon life does not bring terror to the soul of the Sufi. While recognizing that the universe is but an illusion and life but a puppet show, he remembers that if God is ail there is, then the individual must be a part of or phase of God. And toward the union with God he bends all his soul and life, discarding the sugar plum reward of heavenly bliss in future worlds, as taught in the Mohammedan Creed, he seeks to fly straight to the heart of being, and seeks his comfort and security there in the bosom of God. The Sufi is a true mystic, and seeks ever for the union with the Beloved One. He strives to enter into conscious union with God here in earth life, and hopes for absorption in God in the future when his soul leaves the body. He leaves the thousand heavens of the Orthodox Mohammedan. He will have none of them, but piercing through the illusion which embraces even the highest heavens, like the arrow to the mark, or the homing pigeon to its nest, he flies straight to the embrace of the Beloved. During his lifetime, he indulges in meditations, reveries, and silences. He also favors sacred dances to slow music accompanied by rhythmic movements of the body. He feels strange longings of the soul, which he holds to be dim memories of his previous blissful state in the bosom of the One, and the natural craving to return thirdo. He believes that his ideas of the good, the beautiful, and the true are but memories of his previous bliss. He believes in fate and destiny, but holds them to be but the divine stage machinery in the drama of the universe. His soul is ever homesick for the one. And in this spirit, Avicenna, the Sufi poet, sings of the mourning soul, sighing over its loss, and long for its home journey and return to its beloved. Lo, it was hurled midst the signposts and ruined abodes of this blessed world. It weeps when it thinks of its home, and the peace it possessed, with tears welling forth from its eyes without pause or rest, and with plaintive mourning it brewdeth like one bereft over such trace of its home, 
as the fourfold winds have LT. And so, with constant faith and ardent hope lives on the Sufii, seeking ever the path which leads to union, perplexed not by the speculations of the theologians and the philosophers, he answers simply, He knows about it all. He knows, he knows. And who among us can dispute his wisdom?